Now let us enter into a season of prayer as we pray together. Almighty and ever-present God, be with us in this season of prayer that you might hear the inmost voices of our hearts and draw close to us. We pray for the world, O Lord, which seems so easily to move from conflict to conflict without pause for peace. We pray, O Lord, for the people of Syria. Show us a way of being with and for the people of that poor and battered country without enmeshing ourselves in yet another war. Indeed, O Lord, we pray for so many people in so many countries where the rule of law and civility has collapsed. We pray for Iraq, Somalia, Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and parts of Nigeria. We know that you have not called us into being in this life to die on the funeral pyre of chaos and violence. Let your spirit come upon the people of those nations. Let the fighting between tribes and factions cease so that the unity brought about by your spirit might begin to build a new civic order in these places, and people may live without fear of those uniformed to protect them. We pray for the people of this country, O Lord, who struggle each day to bring order into their own lives, those without enough money to support themselves and their families, those who live in substandard and dilapidated housing, those who go to bed each night hungry for a safe home and a decent meal. We are mindful that you have special care for the poor and the oppressed. At the same time, we are aware that you have showered us with the gifts of security, safety, food, clothing, transportation, all of that you have given to us graciously. Help us to be more open to the needs of the poor and more generous with our gifts of time and resources to minister to their needs. We pray, O Lord, for this church. We pray for those who lead and those who follow. Let us do all things in love and let your work, show forth your grace and power in this place. We pray for those who will be helping with Vacation Bible School this week. Bless them as they prepare for this important work. We pray too for those who reach out to others with the promises of God and the good news of the gospel. Do not let them be discouraged, but rather rejoice in the work that they do. We ask your special blessing upon those who are sick and those who are recovering from illness. We pray your blessing upon those whose bodies are weakened by disease and age and those whose minds are overburdened by anxiety and strife. We know that no brokenness is beyond your healing and no anxiety beyond your caring. Let your spirit Come among us, that we might know your healing in the deepest reaches of our lives. We pray, too, for those who are especially on our minds this morning as we pray silently for them. Hear our prayer, O Lord, and bind us together as one, that we might all pray the prayer your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture this morning comes from Psalm 85. Verses 8 through 13. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his peoples, to his saints, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground. And righteousness will look down from the sky. Yea, the Lord will give what is good, and our Lord will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Here, too, this word from the New Testament. In the first chapter of Ephesians, beginning at the first verse, or at the third verse, I'm sorry, that's a typo on my part. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for as adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. He has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption in God, as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Yes. Being an Israelite is all about family. If we go back and we look at the Old Testament and and we get to those passages, the infamous passages of begats, it was important for the Israelites to be able to say who their lineage was. It began with, my father was a wandering airman, and show their connection all down through history. 
catching or briefly pausing only to catch their breath from time to time. For who could say all of that in one breath? There were, of course, some problems with that lineage, as there are with most of us as we go back and try to find out and ferret out who our relatives are. There's always somebody back there that we don't know quite how they fit into the family. And if you watched any of these uh, uh, genealogy programs on TV, you know the embarrassing moment when the great reveal comes and says, you know, well, I'm sorry, but you're really not related to uh, you know, the Mary Queen of Scots or, uh, or the Dauphin of, Pr of France. You know, it, your, your family lineage just didn't work out that way. Um, there are some embarrassing moments in the Old Testament. Dan, Asher, Gad, Naphtali were all born of slaves, not of Jacob's wives. But they had an interesting custom. Rachel asked Jacob that she be allowed to have the child born at my knee so that it would be Jacob's legitimate heir. That meant Jacob would go and lay with the slave, and then Rachel would take her as her own. When I first figured that out, where that phrase, born at my knee, I was really kind of taken aback, because I had grown up in a Western or Northwestern family where you used to talk about the youngest children or the next to the youngest children as being knee babies. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase or not, but it always shocked me because it meant like, oh, now wait a minute, did that mean dad did something he shouldn't ought to have done? Um, but it still persists in our culture as the younger children being referred to as knee babies with the rather glossed over explanation of those were the children you had late in life who only stood as tall as your knee. Well, according to scripture, that's not exactly what that means. You see, the Israelites had no law of adoption, which I found remarkable. They even had really weird ways of continuing lineage even when it was clear that it wouldn't happen. Um, they had this, this mechanical system that if, if there were two brothers and both of them were married and one of them died without issue, the remaining brother was required to marry his brother's wife and have children by her who would be considered to be his brother's lineage, even if for a time he had two wives. Um, adoption was known in Roman culture, which is indeed part of the culture that, that Paul is writing to in, in Ephesians, but it too was somewhat unusual and extraordinary. Slaves might be adopted by the pater familias or the head of a family in order to make it possible for them to be freed and to become Roman citizens. This frequently happened with very close body servants or tutors or those who had been captured in war and had become, uh, for all practical purposes, part of the family. Adults were even adopted in order to keep land in the family or to preserve an inheritance and the name of a great family. But it became so abused later in the Roman Empire that by the time of Ephesians, the idea of someone being adopted by a prominent family would mean that they would have to be approved either by the Senate or by proclamation of the emperor. So that adoption was a really closely held thing in Roman culture. One adoption in Egypt went like this. The wife is adopted as a daughter 
and therefore heir. When her husband dies, she adopts three slaves who were her husband's children by a concubine. For Israel, lineage was family. For Rome, Greece, and Egypt, family was about inheritance. So you have, on the one hand, the Israelite notion that the important thing about lineage is that God keeps God's promise to Abraham that your descendants will be like the stars in the skies or the grains of sand on the beach. It is about the physical reality of continuing to be able to call yourselves God's people as Abraham's family. On the other hand, in Rome, Greek, Roman, Greek, and Egyptian culture, it's about property. So Paul is speaking about adoption in some ways from a Greco-Roman perspective, which shouldn't be surprising. Paul was a Roman citizen speaking to a church in the midst of Roman culture. And so it isn't surprising that he speaks of inheritance in the same paragraph with adoption. Even so, in Paul's time, adoption was a radical and rarely used means of grafting someone into the family. And yet, that's exactly what Paul claims for the church. That's what makes this passage such a pivot point in this letter is that Paul is in some ways saying that this adoption is even more radical than the resurrection because ancient mythology had stories of heroes dying and being reborn again or dying and their spirits being reborn in a new character who then became the heroic savior of the community or of the nation um, in, the, in the, 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 the myth of Gilgamesh. There's, there's lots of, of this kind of tinge of resurrection. That was one of the reasons why it was so important that when they were meeting at Nicaea, what they were talking about when they talked about resurrection, they were talking about bodily resurrection, not mythology. But on the other hand, adoption by God? That's a radical notion. Because it didn't mean, in fact, Paul says it didn't mean that we were all that deserving. It didn't mean that we were preserving anything. It didn't mean <coughs> that we were adopting in order to preserve God's presence in the world. It didn't mean to continue the lineage of believers by saying we were adopted, but adoption as a free and gracious gift that grafted us into the body of Christ as brothers and sisters with the Lord. That's, that's very strong language. You know, my family has had some experience with adoption, but I'm not going to share that with you today. But I will share with you, you know, that there's a real significant difference in our, in our culture about being foster parents and being adoptive parents. You know, if you're a foster parent, you take someone in and you try to raise them, and many foster parents who have become habitual about being foster parents will even say, I have raised this person just like my child. But there is a point at which foster care ends and the person leads their own life. They aren't a part of your family, and they don't inherit, and they don't take your name. In adoption, you get a court order that grafts this person to your family. It is permanent 
absolute and unending and makes that person eligible for the full rights as though they were a biological child. One might say that until the time of Christ, God had a kind of a foster care relationship with the people of Israel, when you think about it. A court order wasn't given at Mount Sinai mandating that the people of Israel became God's children, even though God spoke at times as though they were his children. But there are periods of time when it seems as though God is giving them another chance. I will raise you up as though you were my children, and I will give you another chance. And they would run off and go do their own thing. They would follow after the pocket the prophets of Baal. But on the cross is a permanent, irrevocable, eternal grafting in of humanity to God's family. We are all children of God. Because, as Paul would claim, God has adopted us into his family, not as servants or slaves, but as children. That relationship is a gift, not a biological inevitability. Adoption is a choice, a risk, and an awesome responsibility. And I am sure that many of us could conjure up visions of God talking to one of the angels and with the angel saying, God, whatever possessed you to do that? Do you see what a mess they are and what a mess they make of your earth, of your creation? And God probably re replied, yes, but do you know that adoption is also an overwhelmingly enriching and growing experience. Our lineage is not such a good one that we are anything much, but our inheritance is something that goes beyond our understanding in spiritual richness, joy, and celebration. God takes us to his own family that we might grow up with the advantages of that inheritance. God takes us up and calls us by name because we are his and we are his children. Our adoption into the household of God is more than being noticed or even cared for. It is being grafted into a new being in Christ. All of this means that we begin to take on the characteristics of one of God's household. Our thoughts are the ones of the household of God. Our values become the values of the family, a just and caring God. Peace, justice, mercy, kindness, and love are not just something that we rattle off as though those were merit badges on a sash. They become ingrained in our lives. Our goals are transformed into the goals and the visions of those who are God's children. Our expectations become the expectations of those reared in the family of God and God's children. And just as our children stray from us for a while and then eventually come back to their heritage, we frequently depart from God only to be reminded by some event, some word, some smell that reminds us who we are and whose we are. It is like the prodigal son's story. We go away from God only that to discover in the separateness 
what and who we value. There's a cattle rancher in Kansas named Jane Cougar. She says, last year a colt was born in the early morning and I was there with it. That afternoon, I was in New York on Broadway buying a ticket. I was standing in line, everything shoulder to shoulder, and I was thinking about a wet colt in Chase County, Kansas. And I felt I knew how different this place was and what it's worth. I love New York, and one of the reasons that I love it is that it shows me what I have in my county in Kansas. As a pastor for 40 years, I can tell you, as you walk into a church and you bump into children, you can tell the ones who are just visiting from the ones who feel themselves part of the family. They walk up to people they're not biologically related to and hug them on their knee. They flash a smile to people or put their arms up to be lifted up and hugged. They walk around the building as though they own it. Wow, it's their home. The children who are strangers, they're a lot more reticent with others. They're not even sure they want to shake the pastor's hand as they go out the door because, after all, they're a stranger. But children and then adults who are raised in the church and adults who become regulars in this building, this is your house. This is where you come and you're relaxed and comfortable. Some people, even despite the rousing sermon that they may get from the pulpit, even nod off from time to time because they're so comfortable in this place. Being adopted into the household of God is not just an easy experience. Adoptions don't always go well. We sometimes get into our lover's quarrel with God. But over the years, the changes that take place in who we are, how we see the world, and what we value, both for ourselves, our children, and the rest of our family, change. It's like the DNA within us lines up a little bit differently. The hurts and harms that we have in the rest of the world slowly are healed by the love and the care of people we may only know as our Sunday brothers and sisters. But you see, that's the miracle. God loves us. It is like a friend of mine who's a pastor um, in another presbytery who was adopted as an infant. And we talked about adoption. And, and he told me once, he said, John, I was adopted as an infant. I went directly from the hospital to my mother's arms, my adoptive mother's arms. I have never known anyone else as my mother than her. I have never had any curiosity about my biological parents or my biological lineage because the only mother I have is the one who burped me, who stayed up nights with me when I was sick, who rooted for me, in my baseball games, and who encouraged me and cared for me throughout my entire life. <coughs> he said, that is my mother. 
and there will be no other. You know, I hate to tell you, because for some of us who have divided loyalties between loving and caring mothers who are our heroes and our wonderful advocates, I want to tell you, there are people in the church who for them, the church being here is their salvation. Their mother and their father are sitting in the pews of the church, not in their home. And they, more than any of us, understand what a gracious and good gift it is to be given the adoption certificate of being a part of the household of God. And it is even to today a radical notion, a radical notion that God loved us so much that God would call you God's child, each of us. We don't come to God by derivation. We don't come to God because mother went to church. We don't come to God because sister went to church. Or for goodness sake, because some relative became a minister. We are entitled as the inheritance in our lives. The grace of God in our lives. And we should never forget that. It is enduring. It lasts forever. And that's the good news that I came to bring you this morning. Amen. I give you this charge. You are children of God, brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, heirs of God's grace and love. Rejoice and celebrate the mystery of God's love for us that we would in, be included in God's household, not by ancestry, but by choice, by adoption. You know, we still have some space here. Let's see if we can't add to this household of God with more adopted children. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And God's peace be with you now and in the life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen.